the in-class assignment, I posted them, and I think most of them were computational and okay, but it really gets your hands uh, dirty trying to go through these computations and see what they look like. I put these on here because I felt a lot of people needed to just do this and actually see what it means to have the um, elements of the groups be entire cosets. So this was, um, the first one was the group Z8 with the normal group, the cyclic group generated by two. And I, I did all the computations so you can see them. What does one plus two mean? It's one, three, five, seven, and so forth. And you end up with only two cosets because there are redundancies if you continue on. If you place them in the group setting um, with the Cayley table and you add via, and I put a little direction here of what I mean by adding, we add cosets by adding the, um, the components out in front so we get one plus two. So we are able to fill into the table. And you actually can look at that and see that that's, um, that's going to be uh, isomorphic to Z2. I think a few of you are already doing this in class, but a Z and um, the cyclic group generated by five, you actually end up getting only five cosets. Those are the five you get because once you start with five, you, if you add five to the cyclic group generated by five, you're back to zero again. So if you place them into a table, I might not have even done this as a table format. I quit the table format. There you go. There's a table. It just went out of order for some reason. But this is the table that you get when you generate the five and the different. And when you do the addition via the way you're supposed to do the addition by definition, um, you get this table generated here. So I think the pages are out of order. I hope you can put up with me. We'll figure it out in a second. Um, number four, the question asked if you know that AH is equal to BH, is it true that HA is going to be equal to B, HB? And um, those of you who've had two semesters of abstract algebra as an undergrad probably felt this doesn't feel right. Um, and if you choose an example why it doesn't feel right, kind of has something to do with abelianness. So maybe you should go to an example where something's not abelian. Choose S3, which is not abelian, and just choose a normal H in there, or any H in there will probably do, and then try to come up with an AH that equals a BH. I had to mess around with it. You can see my eraser marks on there. I mess around with it, and I got an AH to equal a BH. But um, HA and HB didn't end up being the same two. So this is not true. I think you guys were doing this one in class. It was challenging, but it was one of these proofs where you were just trying to stretch a rug into different corners, and it just took some time to pull it into the corners. It was uh, kind of a, I don't know, it's irritating proof, I think. <laughs> it's, the way it's, like, it's not a beautiful proof where you go, ha, at the end. Um, you can go through the proofs yourself. I tried to lay it out in steps so it's easy to get through. What I kept coming up with, though, was when I was trying to show that AH equals BH, um, when I was trying to show the conclusion that H equals GH, G inverse, I kept coming up with a need to have some kind of, to use the property that I was given, which was AH equals BH implies that HA equals BHB. I had to somehow get inverses involved in these cosets. And so um, somehow I kept moving towards a reformulation of my no in terms of inverse elements. So this is why instead of using this no, I use this no. That this, this is equivalent to this. So now I have it ter in terms of inverses, and this term is equivalent to this term. If you keep playing around, this, this whole problem was irritating because your no almost had nothing, it didn't look like what you had to show. So somehow you have to get to a place where the no and the show look like each other. So you need some equi equivalent statements that involve the inverses. This is where I came up with that. And so if you uh, rephrase the no in terms of inverses, it turns out to be this object over here. And uh, I, it's grunt work, but just, you know, you keep using the definition and going through it. I'm not going to go through it de in detail. <coughs> 
And then once I have that property, I'm able to get through the rest of it because I'm playing around with the A's and the B's. Uh, anybody take a look at this? It, I just looked at it for class, and what I, what I was trying to do was you can show that both A and B are in, like A is equal to some B, H, and it's also equal to some H, B. Right. Therefore, if you just take the inverse of one, you can show that B, H, B inverse is an, uh, it equals H, or some H in the set. It's, uh, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I was just looking at it, and I thought that was... Um, that is the kind of machinery I was using to do any of this. Yeah. If you notice, that's exactly what I was doing, is taking an element for the set and then using the fact that you had... In, right. right. It's exactly the same machinery. Yeah. I just somehow, when I was trying to do it just directly, I kept ending up with lots of little right. tidbits here and there, and I couldn't get them to all pull together the way I wanted them to right. until I wrote it this way. So. I got caught up in trying to show... The, the, they must be normal, but that isn't true. No, it they, doesn't. They yeah. don't necessarily have. Yeah. So it, this is um this is an introduction to annoying proof. This is an annoying proof. <laughs> C was mislabeled. Um, I think I put something twice. And the rest of it wasn't bad. Um, prove that if n is normal, then a n a inverse is contained in n piece of cake just by using the definition of a subset you get there. So this wasn't, C wasn't bad. Um, e wasn't bad either. If N is a normal subgroup, prove that N is a subset of A, N, A inverse. Um, that's not a, at all terrible to prove. It's just following the rules of subset and going through it. So as far as I thought, I think only B was the bad one the one where you had to actually prove that one piece you're given information that looks so widely different from what you have to show. The ring part was interesting because it's a puzzle. So if you enjoy puzzles, you enjoy this problem. In number one, it was fairly easy. Um, you set up the addition table and use Latin squares to figure out the addition table. But for the multiplication table, um, you use the distributive law and you come up with each multiplication ends up being right <coughs> back at A so you get a table full of it's the multi. It's the ad additive uh, identity. Number two was a little bit more interesting. Yeah. Right. I don't see how you go from b times b equals a to a times b equals b times b times a. Right. Well, um, there's a theorem. And it's in your book that zero times anything is zero. Mm -hmm. So the m additive identity times anything that's any other element is going to be zero in any ring. So I'm using that fact. So if I get, um, C, uh, so if I use the distributive law here, for example, b times quantity c plus b, well, I just go to this table, c plus b is a. So I, this really is b times a, sure. right? I see, I see that. Uh, and anything times zero is zero. A is the ident is a is the zero in this uh, additive table. I didn't see that. Um. <coughs> and that that's how I. That's how I use the A in, in a way that I can get where I need to get. And in fact, I probably did this on number two as well. It's the same table. The additive table is the same for as number one because you're just filling out Latin squares. The thing that's different here <coughs> is that here you're given this element. And this is not a dynamic PowerPoint, so everything was filled in after I did the computations. But this is the end table that I got. Of course, when A is multiplied times anything, you get zero. So you get a bunch of zeros in this direction. A is the zero. So it's only this part of the table you have to fill in. So here's an example of how I came up with um, B times B, or B times B in this case. B times, by using the distributive law, I get B times the quantity B plus C is B times B plus B times C. But B plus C is A, so this is really the same thing as B at B times A, but A is the zero element, so this is A. So this tells me that B times B is negative B times C, which is the added inverse of B times C. And then I do the same thing for C times the quantity B plus C. And slowly, bit by bit, um, I you know, I have to actually look up at my <coughs> addition table. For example, the added inverse of B, by looking up at the addition table, turns out to be C. So I'll use these facts and eventually come up with C times B is C, 
or b times b is neg minus b times it's all in pieces. And once you get the pieces done, you're able to compute the whole thing. So I think I outlined where I got each piece. It might be different than the path you run, but um, it's distributive law that lets you get fill in the multiplication table. It's the only thing you have. There's nothing else you have other than zero times anything is zero. Okay, any questions on that? Rough day today? Quiet. Don't.